Let me read to you a passage from the 11th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, verses 1 to 13. It's the Gospel for Sunday of the 17th week of Ordinary Time. St. Luke writes, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone in debt to us, and do not subject us to the final test. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend to whom he goes at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived at my house from a journey, and I have nothing to offer him. And he says in reply from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children and I are already in bed. I cannot get up to give you anything. I tell you, if he does not get up to give the visitor the loaves because of their friendship, he will get up to give him whatever he needs because of his persistence. And I tell you, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. What father among you would hand his son a snake when he asked for a fish, or hand him a scorpion when he asks for an egg? If you then who are wicked know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That's from Luke 11, verses 1 to 13. And what does it suggest to us? Well, anyone with a modicum of historical knowledge will know that religion is fundamental to human history and all pervasive in the cultures of man. The glaring exception, we could call it an anomaly, is the secular Western culture of the last few centuries since the Reformation and the Enlightenment, together with those cultures and philosophies that have been influenced by the secularization of Western culture. If religion has been part of human cultures, so has prayer, because prayer is at the heart of religion. When we look at the life of prayer of mankind, be it public or private, we see an enormous variation. The question naturally arises then, how should we pray? We cannot simply look to the testimony and practices of the various peoples, because their testimony differs so profoundly. Rather, in the first instance, we must look to what God has revealed about prayer, and the record of his revelation is given to us in the scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, and is interpreted and taught by the church, especially in her catechisms. Now, is there any way of getting at the essence of what God has revealed to us about true prayer, prayer that is pleasing to him, and therefore fruitful? Yes, there is. And it is, of course, contained in the teaching of our Lord himself. What he teaches about prayer sums up the entire teaching of the Old Testament and fulfills it with his own revelation. Jesus Christ is our teacher in all things involving God and most especially in the art and practice of prayer. It needs to be said in our day that the Christian looks to him and not primarily to other sources for his life of prayer. Our gospel passage today that I read is a most important expression of our Lord's timeless teaching on prayer. As ever, it is simple, concrete and illustrated by parables and parallels from everyday life. Firstly, it gives us our Lord's own prayer the prayer he taught his disciples 
when they asked him to teach them how to pray. Because this prayer comes from the lips of our Lord himself, it ought be a fundamental prayer for our whole life. We ought pray it slowly and fervently every day, and whenever it is prayed or sung at Mass, it ought never be taken for granted or said or sung routinely. If we pray it well always during life, at the hour of our death, we shall be able to pray it with deep fervour. I remember reading after Pope Paul VI died in 1978, that as he was dying he prayed the Lord's Prayer in Latin. His cause for canonization is progressing. Imagine going from this life and in, into the presence of God with the Lord's Prayer filling our mind, heart and soul. It is often said that during the last moments of our life we draw on those simple things that have proved to be our nourishment and stay through the years. So I invite you to make the Lord's Prayer of our Gospel today just that, a principal prayer of your daily life. I recommend that you pray it with fervour often during each day, allowing its parts to shape your spiritual life. It will shape our life with the thought that God is the loving Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and because we are in Him by faith and baptism, God is our loving Father too. And thus, in union with Jesus, we address Him as our Father. Because He is our Father, we can address our petitions confidently to Him. And our Lord tells us in the prayer that He has taught what those petitions ought be. We ought make these petitions our own and shape our lives according to them. Let us not take this prayer for granted simply because we know it so well. It contains, in summary, all God's revelation on prayer, and that is why the Church in her catechisms presents her teaching as a commentary on the Lord's Prayer. In our passage today, having taught his prayer to the disciples, our Lord goes on to comment on it, and the comment he makes stresses the great confidence we ought have in presenting our petitions to God our Father. Our confidence ought be a share in the confidence of Jesus himself in praying to his heavenly Father. Our Lord tells us that if we ask, we shall receive. Most especially, shall we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So confident is he of our Lord's, of our Lord's teaching here, that St. James tells us in his letter that if we do not receive what we have asked for, it is because we have not asked for it in the way we should. How should we address our petitions to our Heavenly Father then? We do it in the way and with the attitude and with the mind of Christ. We ought try to do everything, including our prayer, in Christ and as he would do it. When we pray, we ought unite ourselves with our Lord and in his presence ask ourselves if he would be pleased to unite our petitions with his. Is my petition to God pleasing to him and does it bring glory to our Heavenly Father? Is my petition one that I am convinced Christ would be pleased to make his own? If so, then present that petition perseveringly with persistence to God our Father knowing that he will answer it in the way he knows best for me and for his glory.